Welcome everyone to the um, bite-sized series of lectures which uh, we're running over the next six weeks and I'm delighted to see so many of you have joined us today. Um, so the introduction for this one is that we're running education healthcare plans um, and I'm joined by my colleague Erin Smart on this occasion from our public law team. Um, we're also doing a series of other presentations which cover a whole raft of topics which are really useful for um, parents with children with disabilities or professionals who work with um, children who have um, uh, additional needs and we will be running the next one um, which is going to be child to adult transition which is a really important topic so without any further ado I'm going to hand over to my colleague Erin thank you very much hello um, yes, so I'm I'm Erin Smart. I'm a solicitor in the public law team um, and this is a presentation to look at all things education, health and care plan related um, and trying to help parents to identify how how to get the best out of their plan. We're going to be looking at um, who's entitled to an EHC plan, how to get an EHC plan um, annual reviews and, and how best to use those and the appeal rights and, and tribunals. So first of all, who's in touch with EHC plan? So this area of law uh, is governed by the Children and Families Act, which came into force in 2014. Um, you can see on the slide that I've put that section in bold. Um, it, it, was a culmination of four years of consultation moving on from the Children Act, aiming to really get services working together with education, health and care. Um, as, as you can see from the, you know, the clues in the name of the plans now, it's to give parents a bit more say and to get young people involved in their education and to ensure that there's one overall assessment rather than having piecemeal assessments for children so that there is a plan that documents exactly um, the child's needs and the provision to meet those needs all in one place. Um, you can see that there's regulations and certainly the code of practice which also assists parents and local authorities when making these kind of decisions but really it is part three of the Children and Families Act that we'll be focusing on today. Okay, so the key changes, I've, I've already run through them, but they are there on the slide and, and I should say that I've put quite a lot of detail on the slides, but we do have a relatively short time slot and I, I want to allow time for questions, so I will be rattling through these, but obviously the idea is that then the slides contain information that you can look through at your leisure and really kind of dig into, into the issues, but what I want to do is give you a flavour across the board and kind of focus in on the elements that I think are most important and hopefully most relevant for most of you. So these are the kind of key changes in the 2014 Act. Um, really, it's it's about, as I've already said, kind of moving things on so that the parents and young people are at the centre of things to simplify the process and allow for one overall assessment for an education, health and care plan. Um, the definition of SEN remains unchanged. And I think that is important to know um, when looking at the education, health and care plans is that actually in terms of getting a plan, it should continue to be relatively straightforward and I will go through that with you. So as per the last slide, the definition uh, that a child has significantly greater difficulty in accessing learning than the majority of same age peers. So you can see it's quite a broad definition um, and certainly doesn't require diagnosis or professional reports or a certain amount of uh, provision in a mainstream school. You know, it, it really is a very straightforward legal definition. And similarly, in terms of special educational provision, so it's training that's additional to that provided in a mainstream school essentially um, and again that's a wide-reaching definition you can see that the threshold can be met in any number of instances um, additional learning support assistance support um, 
in small groups, for example, certain peers, class sizes, any sort of therapy provision, all of those things would fall under special educational provision. It's not so prescriptive that it narrows that down um, and actually should allow for a degree of flexibility when applying the law. Um, other definitions in in relation to education, health and care plans from the Act, um, health care provision, social care provision. I mean, it's relatively obvious, I would say. Um, and I think what's important is that in terms of provision which educates or trains, that should still be considered educational provision. So even if it's coming from a recommendation from a health professional or a social care professional, if it educates and trains a child or young person, that is still considered educational provision. Um, and um, you'll see why that's important as we as we go through the slides. Uh, as I say, I have already touched on this and it, it is one of the key changes from uh, the children in the Children and Families Act, and that is to give greater weight to parental and young person views. Section 19 actually specifies this in the, in the legislation, um, which was a real turning point, actually, I think, for, for a lot of parents and young people. And the local authority now must have regard to the views, wishes and feelings of the child and young person um, and their parents. You can see that it's much more child centred um, as it should be and it's really aiming to to solidify the importance of their contribution and their participation in those decisions. As I said the you know again the Children and Families Act really did try to solidify and, and ensure that there was only this one overall assessment with health, social and education agencies working together um, and those duties are further specified in, in the Children and Families Act. OK, so now that we've looked at a kind of very quick overview of the key changes in the legislation and, and where this information is coming from, um, let's look a little bit more at actually applying it in practice um, and how those definitions and um, those new duties are important in terms of looking at obtaining an education, health and care plan. So this is the process to um, request and to receive an education, health and care plan. It's simplified um, and it should be simple, therefore, for parents to do, although I appreciate that um, and I'm sure that you'll tell me it's not necessarily the parental experience. So an education, health and care needs assessment is the first step. Um, they've replaced the kind of um, learning disability assessments and the statement in process. And it's the idea of, of it is to be more simplified to allow for that overall assessment, one assessment for one plan. Um, parents or schools can request an EHC needs assessment and it's important that parents are aware that they do also have that right. So, you know, it doesn't depend on the school supporting the application. Parents can make that request of their own accord. The local authority, once receiving that request from parents or school, should notify the parents within six weeks of their decision as to whether or not they're going to carry out um, an assessment. The actual assessment itself should include specific advice, which again is laid out in legislation um, and it includes, as you would expect, professionals from across the board, education, health and social care. When the assessment is completed, um, which should be done within 10 weeks, by week 16, so six weeks for the decision, 10 weeks for the assessment, by week 16, the local authority must then confirm whether or not it will be issuing an education, health and care plan. And um, the plan is first issued in draft to parents for them to provide their own input in terms of the um, the contents in, in all sections across the board um, and will allow the parents at that point to request a school to be named. Parents have 15 days to respond to an EHC plan in draft. But what I would say is that, you know, don't be afraid to ask for an extension of that time, um, especially in the current climate. You know, people have got a lot of other pressures on their time. So I, I think it is reasonable to request an extension. Um, and, and certainly in our experience, local authorities tend to agree to those. Um, 
in any event, it's a, it is a draft document at this stage, so there, there still is the, the ability to, to request changes to specify further um, information into the plan. Um, and I will go through the contents of the plan later, but this is the first opportunity that you have to really ensure that that plan is drafted appropriately. So once once that's gone back to the local authority, the local authority then considers the changes requested by parents and the local authority should finalise that plan by week 20. So that's 20 weeks from the request for an assessment going in. Now, of course, what I will say is that I've not added into here the potential points of appeal, um, but suffice to say that at any point that a local authority makes a decision, the parents do have a right to appeal, but clearly that would then put a pause on that time frame while the tribunal decides the case. Um, and again, we will go through that as um, later on in the slide, sorry. Okay. Sorry, okay. Okay, so I've gone through the assessment process in terms of the professionals that should be involved. But what I would say here is that it's really important to know the criteria that the local authority must apply in making their decision as to whether or not to assess a child or young person. So a child must be assessed by the local authority if they have or may have special educational needs and it may be necessary for special educational provision. Um, again, you can see that that is a relatively low threshold. It doesn't require diagnosis. It doesn't require things like um, evidence of two terms worth of interventions. There are various policies employed by local authorities which suggest that there is a kind of checklist that parents and schools must go through before making an application for an education, health and care needs assessment. But as you can see very clearly from section 36, that is not the case. Um, the test is very straightforward. If you or the child's school feels that there may be an area of special educational need and that they may require provision above that in a mainstream school, then the local authority must assess. Um, and certainly if you do receive um, a response from the local authority or school indeed, trying to suggest that actually you need to provide evidence of two times worth of interventions, you need to follow a cycle of assess, plan, do, review, um, or that there needs to be a diagnosis or professional report to go in with your request, um, I would very clearly point to this act and point to this section to identify the correct threshold and the correct test that the local authority should be applying. That's not to say that the evidence shouldn't be included. Of course, if you have evidence of a diagnosis, if you have evidence that provision is already being provided, then you can see very quickly that that is, would evidence those criteria that they have or may have SEN and that it may be necessary for, for extra provision. So it's very important then that those are properly considered by the local authority and properly considered by the school when trying to assess whether or not an assessment is required. Um, and, and as I say, it is it is very important to, to bear that in mind. Um, another issue here that we find often is where children may have transitioned from primary to secondary without needing an education health and care plan but actually at the point of secondary school realizing that you know that's it's quite a big step up and that maybe there is some some needs that need to be further identified there is no restriction on when you can request an education health and care needs assessment so it can be requested at any point of the child's school career and indeed any time up until the child is 25 um, if the local authority refuses to conduct an assessment, then this is an area that can be appealed, is a decision, sorry, that can be appealed to the tribunal and the tribunal most certainly will be applying that test and criteria in section 36. Okay, so this again, you know, we've, we've gone through the timetable really, um, but just to to further specify the um, assessment information that the local authority have to have to obtain, um, it's really important that the child 
and young person and pair or child or young person sorry and parents views are properly recorded um, and what what's really important to remember is that these assessments will form the evidence base for any education health and care plan that is then drafted so once you've got those assessment details the draft plan then comes into play um, again within 16 weeks of the request it, the local authority should confirm the outcome of the assessment and um, whether or not it will be issuing a plan. Okay. It's at that point that a school request can be made. Um, so these are considered parental preference schools. Um, the child or, um, sorry, the young person or the child's parents can then request a particular school and the local authority at that point must consult with that school. The local authority have to name parental preference unless the school is unsuitable for the age, aptitude or SCN or, and this is the one that local authorities quite often rely on, um, it would be incompatible with the efficient use of resources or the efficient education of others. So this clearly would come into play where a parent is requesting an independent school setting. Um, there are many reasons that parents would request an independent school setting, for example, smaller class sizes, the specialism within the school, the experience that the staff at the school have in meeting the needs of, of children. But you can see that the local authority can refuse to name on the basis of um, inefficient use of resources. But importantly, that is a test that the local authority must apply correctly. So if they are suggesting that it's because it's incompatible with the efficient use of resources, i.e. it costs too much, then you should be asking for evidence as to what those costs are and how they compare to the local authority proposed school. OK. OK, one of the things to actually just before I move on in terms of a request for a particular school. So you know, as, as we've already gone through, the, the local authority must name the parental preference unless those ex exceptions apply. Um, and once a school is named in the EHCP, the school then must admit the pupil. Um, you know, the, the whole point of that consultation period between the local authority and the schools is for the schools to come back and agree that they are suitable or indeed to suggest that they are not suitable and for the local authority to look into that. Whichever response the school gives, if they are named in the EHC plan, they must admit the pupil. OK. OK, so in terms of the health section of the EHC plan, um, Obviously, you know, this this is a school kind of webinar, so we won't spend too much time on this other than to say that obviously there is a duty to identify health needs into an education, health and care plan. Um, and that there is a designated medical officer that should liaise with the parents and the local authority regarding those assessments. Um, the plan itself should include these details and certainly we would expect to see anything in relation to um, the child's health needs like epilepsy or um, being tube fed, things like that are, are clearly very important and should be included in the health section. But what I would absolutely emphasise is that if it has an impact on education, then it should also be appearing in the educational sections as well. Um, I don't intend to repeat myself, but um, in terms of social care, the same is true. If there is social care needs or social care provision that, that needs to be into the EHCP, of course it should be in the relevant sections, but insofar as it impacts on a child's access to education, it needs to also be in the education sections. Okay, so the final EHC plan, as I've already said, issued within 20 weeks of the request being made um, and should be sent to the school and parents. OK, right now to look at the actual plans. So an education, health and care plan clearly is a legal document. It's legally binding on the local authority. The provision that's in the education, health and care plan must be provided for by either the local authority or the relevant health and social care um, factions of that local authority. So in terms of the format, this is prescribed in the legislation and it's really important that they are properly specified. And as I've already said, at the point of issuing a draft plan right at the very beginning, these are the things you'll be looking out for. OK, so section A, the views, interests and aspirations of the child, young person and parents 
very important section. Certainly we would be expecting parents to add some detail into that. But what I would say, and very importantly, Section A is not um, legally binding. Section A is not legally binding. The local authority do not have a duty to provide what's in Section A because Section A is all about the aspirations for the future. Um, these plans are designed to be child centred and therefore the first section should be identifying um, where the family are aiming for this young person to get to. Section B identifies child's needs, special educational needs. It's really important that these are properly identified um, and everything included into section B that's going to impact on the child's access to education. And the reason it's so important is because section B links directly to section F. So if there has been a need identified in section B, section F should then provide for that need. So you can clearly see that in order to guarantee provision, the needs of the child need to be properly specified. Section C is the health needs section, section D, social care needs. Um, I've gone through what should be in those sections and I don't, I don't intend to go over that um, again, so I'm very conscious of the time. Um, section E details the outcomes for the child um, or young person. And I would suggest that actually section E is best linked to section A because section A outlines what the parents, family, um, child are looking to achieve in their views and their interests. So section E should be looked at in, in a holistic way to ascertain where the child needs to be heading with smart targets um, so that we can make sure that everybody is going in the, in the right direction. Section F is a special educational provision. Now, again, that's linked to Section B, although clearly Section F is in order to achieve those outcomes. Um, it's sometimes problematic in the way that local authorities format their EHCPs because they'll quite often link Section E to Section F. But Section E is, again, as I said, holistic. It's not just about education. So it is important when you're looking at Section F not to only be looking at section E, but also to be looking at section B. And if there's a need identified there, then there also needs to be relevant provision to meet that need. Um, section G is the health provision um, and section H is the social care provision. But do remember, if it educates or trains, it needs to be in section F. Um, section I is educational placement. Parental preference school should be named unless the local authority can provide one of the exceptions. Um, and section J is about personal budgets, which I can talk a bit more on, um, I believe, in the questions. Uh, section K is the advice and information. So essentially the results and outcomes and the reports from the education, health and care needs assessment. OK, the annual review. Now, annual reviews are important because for those of you that are already in possession of an EHCP, this is a chance to look again at the contents of that plan. So going through that for the format that I've just been through and the sections that are important, annual review is a chance to have a very, very careful look at that plan and to ascertain whether or not changes need to be made to the contents. If there are updated reports, then they sh those should be used as evidence at an annual review to request those changes into the EHCP. Um, Again, looking at section F, we need to be very aware of specificity and quantification in the EHCP because it's legally enforceable. In order to be enforceable, it needs to be specific. Phrases such as um, access to and opportunities for are not legally enforceable because we cannot then say clearly to the local authority X, Y and Z is not being provided. You know, if it says in the EHCP, Erin requires one hour of speech and language therapy a week, then very quickly, if I'm not getting an hour a week from a qualified speech and language therapist, as per section F of my plan, we can go back to the local authority and challenge that because the plan is legally enforceable. Um, so it is really important to use annual reviews in the way that they are intended to be used and ensure that those plans are properly drafted, pulling up and pulling in new information and updated professional reports and looking at those outcomes. How far along are we to achieving those? And um, do we need to be putting in different outcomes for the next stage of education? Really, really important um, that these are all looked at on an annual basis. Um, a list of people that must be invited to the meeting, I mean, that's it's a relatively self-explanatory list um, and clearly if there are people that you think should be there for example somebody a therapist that's been supporting your child that um, has a view as to what should be going into the EHCP then by all means request that they also attend after the meeting and this is important here so after 
the annual review meeting, the school has two weeks to send the relevant paperwork to the local authority. That paperwork should include any changes that you or the school are requesting to the EHCP. Once the local authority has received that report, they then have four weeks to decide whether it's going to amend the EHCP, continue the EHCP as it is, or cease. OK, if the local authority does amend, you will then enter back into that kind of draft stage of the EHCP process and it will allow you to, to make further requests into the EHCP to update that and to ensure that it is really specific. OK, so following an annual review, you have a right to appeal, hence we can now have a look at appealing EHCP. So appeals to the tribunal remain under the educational elements. So section B, section F and section I needs provision placement. Um, the local authority must send you notice of your right to appeal within the covering letter. So any decision that they make um, at the point of assessment, at the point of issuing a plan or after annual, any annual review, those give you rights to appeal. Um, you do have to contact a mediation advisor prior to lodging an appeal, but you don't necessarily need to attend mediation, but you must have a certificate that you've spoken to a mediator in order to include that into the paperwork um, with your appeal. You've got two months from the letter from the local authority with the appealable decision in which to lodge your appeal. Um, mediation is also available for health and social care, but the tribunal can only order around education elements. OK. In terms of challenging decisions, you can appeal a refusal to carry out an education, health and care needs assessment. You can appeal a refusal to issue a plan and you can appeal in relation to any disagreement around the contents of the plan. Um, important to note that there is a national trial um, by which the, the tribunal can make recommendations around health and social care, but they are recommendations um, and the, the tribunal predominantly deals with educational issues. So it's really important just to be aware of these rights and to be aware of that deadline. So two months from um, the letter from the local authority with their decision, which can go very quickly, as I'm sure you can imagine. But if if there's something in the plan that you don't think is right or the local authorities refuse to name the school of your preference, then this is certainly something that you want to be considering. Um, because of the Children and Family Act uh, extending the protection from those naught to 25, it's really important to be aware that from the age of 16, children are considered young people for the purposes of any appeal and it will be in their own name rather than the parents name who can make the the appeal of course if there are um questions around capacity then uh, that's something that the, the tribunal is well aware of and, and they allow for essentially an alternative person typically a parent to to assist in that appeal yeah but yeah, ultimately, the final decision rests with the young person. In terms of judicial review, just a quick one on this. Um, this is once this is in order to challenge a, a responsible body, a public body in relation to one of their duties. For example, the local authority's duty to provide what's in an education, health and care plan. If a plan is specific and quantified and yet the provision is not being provided, then judicial review is the route to, to challenge the local authority on that. And um, the time limit for it is three months and that is very strict. So it's very important to be aware of that, that deadline and to ensure that you're acting promptly within those three months. So this the, at the point of realising that that provision is not being provided, it's important to act swiftly um, and to really bring it to a solicitor's attention in order that judicial review proceedings can, can be commenced. OK, I appreciate that that was an incredibly <laughs> quick tour um, of education, health and care plans, but I hope it gave you a flavour for it and I hope that the information on the slides is sufficient to um, provide that background information. And now I believe it's time to look at some questions. Thank you, Thank Aaron. You, Aaron. That, that was incredibly was interesting and detailed um, in terms of a, a, a very fast run through what is a very complicated area of the law. 
Um, you started off by talking about choice, which was the changes in the new um, plans. Uh, we've had loads of questions. I can't tell you how many questions we've had, but um, choice seems to come up a lot. Um, and I'm just going to read out one from the Q&A, which is um, a parents, I assume, uh, the local authority have refused their their send school of choice and they want to send their child to a mainstream school. What what can they do about that? So um, as with any parental preference that's being denied, the parents or young person, um, as the case may be, has a right to appeal that to the tribunal. So the only way that the local authority can refuse a parental preference is if one of those exceptions apply, that the school of parental preference is unsuitable or that it's an inefficient use of resources or incompatible with the efficient education of others. Um, if a parent wants a child to attend a special um, maintained school, then actually the cost implication is, un the cost justification is unlikely to apply. And so really it's a case of then looking at whether or not the special school is suitable to meet the child's needs um, and whether the, the child's attendance would be incompatible with the efficient education of others. Um, but certainly that is something that the tribunal is very well equipped to deal with. Um, and if the parent has got evidence that the special school is suitable, then certainly that would be my advice. Is to, you know, we would be looking at considering um, a tribunal appeal, as is the parent's right. Um, lots of questions about um, can you claim the cost of a tribunal appeal? Is there a bit of an indication as to what these things cost um, that you could help people with? So um, unfortunately, costs in tribunal cases are rare, very, very rare. Um, and it really is an exception to the rule if costs are awarded, unfortunately. Um, legal aid is available. Um, but because it's a parental right of appeal, it is based on parents' means rather than children's. Um, in terms of the costs, it's typically privately funded if a solicitor is involved, but there actually isn't any reason that parents couldn't appeal it without need to incur costs. Um, and certainly in terms of um, our views on the matter, if costs are going to be incurred, the costs really need to be going to getting the professional evidence and that's the best way uh, to ensure that the tribunal are properly informed to make a decision. That's great, thanks Erin. Um, so just moving into evidence really, um, lots of questions about this. I'm trying to lump them together so everyone gets a, a fair response but um, We've had a question about uh, when a parent uh, feels that their child has speech and language needs and the school don't, um, whether they can submit their own evidence. Um, we've also been asked if um, Owen Mitchell, I assume, um, can help to collate evidence. Um, as a clinical negligence lawyer myself, I know that we, we include um, public law costs in our claims and we regularly share information, so I'm sure that that's the case. Is there anything you can do add to that, Erin, to help them? Yes, certainly. So in terms of the evidence that should be considered in an EHC plan, there is no reason that private professional reports can't be used to inform a plan. Um, lots of local authority pushback on, um, oh, well, if it's not an NHS professional, then it can't be included in the plan, which is um, quite frankly nonsense. Um, the tribunal is very clear that if the evidence goes to describing the child's needs and the evidence goes to providing recommendations for provision, then that evidence is capable of being put into an EHCP. Um, and so there is no reason that private professional reports can't be used when considering drafting or amending an education, health and care plan. Um, and certainly in terms of um, instructing professionals, that's you know, absolutely something that we can assist with. Excellent. Um, just about the actual planning and preparation, we've got um, a question about when should you start the process? That's the child who's in nursery school. We've also got a question from um, a parent with a 20 year old um, and they're asking, does it sort of change through the duration of the plan and their education as to what goes into that? In terms of when to start, um, you know, we've, we've gone through the definition as to when um, an education, health and care needs assessment 
meets that criteria um, and that really is the point at which I would say to start the process if you feel that your child has or may have special educational needs and that there may be provision that's required that's the point at which to really start and and certainly it's helpful I, I would think um, to get a plan in place as soon as possible because that is really the way in which to ensure that there is provision moving forwards and um, to ensure that that child is getting proper access to education in terms of from the other end of the spectrum um, and an older young person with an education health and care plan at those annual reviews what we would typically be looking at and what the local authority or tribunal will be looking at are really the outcomes in that plan and whether or not they've been achieved. If it's felt that they've been achieved, then actually the local authority can cease the plan, um, which is an appealable decision. But in any event, those outcomes clearly will need to be reviewed as a young person gets older in order to ensure that they are still relevant. Um, and in order to ensure that the provision is correct in order to achieve those outcomes. I'm assuming, Erin, that if it's residential, then that's all covered as well in the plan? Absolutely. If there is an educational need for residential placement, for example, a working day curriculum, um, then that should certainly be appearing in section F of the plan. Um, and section I should be specifying um, whether that's a 38 week placement or a 52 week placement, um, whatever the case may be. And, and importantly, those are the plans in which I would expect to be seeing some level of social care involvement and information in order that the funding is properly distributed between the local authority departments. OK, thanks very much, Erin. Um, we've had a few questions around what happens if the school that your child is in doesn't agree that you need to have an education health care plan. Um, what can the parents do about that? So parents have the right to request an education health and care needs assessment of their own accord um, without the school's support or indeed without information from the school. I would suggest um, that actually it, it is an evidence based decision. So, of course, if parents are able to get that evidence, then all the better. But there is nothing stopping a parent making the request of their own accord. And if that request is then denied by the local authority, it is again a parental right of appeal to the SCN tribunal to challenge that decision of the local authority. Excellent. We've just had a new question come in, which is um, if a special education needs school is full, can the local authority decide not to name the school on the plan? So in terms of a school being full and being parental preference, typically the, the exception that would be relied upon in that instance would be um, that to place the pupil there would be um, incompatible with the efficient education of others, i.e. that the resources would be so stretched that those already at the school wouldn't be receiving efficient education. That is not to say that that is not appealable. Um, it, in any circumstance, if a parental preference school is not named in the EHCP, then that can be appealed to the tribunal and the tribunal will then consider that legal question, consider whether or not that exception, exception actually applies um, based on the evidence, based on you know written and oral evidence at any hearing in order to, to ensure that the local authority is properly discharging that duty. Thanks, Erin. Um, you said in your presentation that you were going to come back to personal budgets and how to apply for them. I just wondered if you could cover that now. Yeah, of course. So, so um, a personal budget is again a relatively relatively new thing under the um, Children and Families Act. So a personal budget is essentially the pot of money that would be required to provide what's in Section F of the EHCP. Parents can request a personal budget and the local authority does have a duty to provide that figure to parents. Where I think some confusion will occasionally come in is then how that personal budget is uh, distributed. So it can be through direct payments where a parent will then essentially receive that pot of money to, in, to instruct their own professionals, to instruct their own um, support assistance or whatever the case may be in order to fulfil the provision in Section F. But the local authority does not have to agree to provide direct payments. The local authority should 
um, and, and certainly in any instance where they can, they must provide information about the personal budget, i.e. the figure, the number, but they don't have to agree to direct payments. They must provide what's in section F, but it doesn't have to be through direct payments. OK, so the next question that's just come through is um, wh when you're applying for EOTAS, which you can explain what that means, Aaron, um, whereabouts should it apply, uh, actually appear in the plan? Well, this is actually a <laughs> very interesting question. First of all, EOTAS is education other than at school, um, and it does have a very specific legal definition, which is one where a child cannot be educated in any school setting and therefore a school setting cannot be named in the EHCP. There is, it's an area of case law which is always developing um, actually and at the moment I don't know that there is a clear decision on what should be in section I. The latest case law seem to be suggesting that section I should be naming um, a future placement, so somewhere that the child will be attending once they've had this um, provision of education other than at school, once they've kind of reached the point of being able to be reintegrated into a school setting, that that should be the setting that's named in section I. But there is conflicting case law on this point um, and certainly something that I think will be further clarified down the line. But where a child cannot be educated in a school, mainstream or special or independent, that plan should be even more so detailed in section F as to what that education is then going to look like while the child is not in a formal school setting. Thanks Erin. Um, we've got about five minutes left although I don't know whether you want to run over a little bit. You've got so many questions. Um, really interesting stuff as well. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, we were pre-sent a question which is, is, are you experiencing in the public law team any interruption in decisions being made on appeal because of coronavirus? On a, For a tribunal appeal, um, I think to begin with there was a slight delay just while everybody kind of got their head around remote hearings and, and, and video hearings and things like that. Um, and unfortunately that there, there, there has been some delay in in receiving decisions um but on the whole i think the tribunal are still sticking to their prescribed timetable which is a 12-week appeal timeline within which the local authority are given the opportunity to respond the opportunity is given to provide further information and there's an opportunity to look at the ehc plan in more detail um, and then from the point of the hearing the tribunal then has 10 working days to provide a written decision and and it, it, to my knowledge that is still the case in the majority of appeals okay great um we've got a question come through my child has down syndrome with a full education healthcare plan um can i send her to um a special needs school but out of my area which um obviously this parent in the particular needs of that child prefers is that possible absolutely um if it's a parental preference school um out of area independent non-maintained whatever it should be consulted with by the local authority um the reason I think probably that local authorities tend not to name out of county placements is because of the cost, uh, both of the provision and of transport. So that is just something to bear in mind when you're looking at those potential exceptions to naming a parental preference. But, but certainly there is nothing stopping a parent requesting an out of county school. So another follow up question, which is uh, what happens if the local authority decides to cease the education health care plan? What can we do in those circumstances? So if a uh, if, if an education health and care plan is going to be ceased, that is another decision which is appealable to the tribunal. Um, and actually, importantly, while a decision to cease uh, an education health and care plan is under the tribunal and awaiting a decision, the plan must continue to be provided. So what's in section F will be maintained until such time that a decision is reached by the tribunal. Clearly, if the tribunal decide that actually the local authority made the right decision in ceasing the plan, the plan will then cease. But if the uh, tribunal decides that that plan should continue, then again, that plan continues to be maintained. 
I'm not sure I understand the next question. It's um, it's saying that um, they have a 19 year old child. It might be we need a bit more clarification on this. Um, and they say the local authority has taken away the plan. Um, they think it's because they're pursuing a clinical negligence claim. Um, do you think those two things are connected, Erin? I mean, it's, it's surely appealable. Certainly appealable, absolutely. Um, it shouldn't be connected, is the short answer. Um, where parents are kind of looking into uh, clinical medical negligence type claims, local authorities can occasionally see that as an opportunity to withdraw support on the basis that parents would be able to fund that privately through the claim. Um, but that's not the legal position. You know, local authorities have a duty to provide suitable education for children with special needs, um, and that's not alleviated by by any sort of claim or, or um, potential funds that the parents may have. Just to, just to add to that from a clinical negligence perspective, Erin, that obviously it's very common for us to recover additional costs for either um, education consultants to help with um, this work and to pay for public lawyers to appeal them. And it's, it's not unusual for us to build in two or three appeals throughout the duration of the, the child's education because every time they transit into a different um, environment, um, again, there could be a problem that we have to appeal. So that's something that we do recover uh, regularly the cost of so that we can uh, help support people. I'm very conscious that we've gone over time. Um, I just wanted to thank Erin for a really interesting talk today. Um, I've certainly learned a lot. Um, this is the first in our bite-sized webinars, which um, I'd urge you to um, try and join us next week, next Monday. Um, and we're going to be doing, in addition to doing uh, child to adult transitions, which is a really important topic, we're going to be doing estate planning, um, which is a really um, important protection issue for, um, if you've got a child with disability. So I'd urge you to come to that one. We're also going to look at capacity, welfare benefits and also relationships when uh, your child get, gets to adulthood. Um, so um, I'd like to thank you very much for joining. Um, if there are questions that we haven't answered, we will try to answer them afterwards. We, we picked up the ones that weren't so long because if it's more detailed advice, it's going to take a little bit of time for us to respond, but we will do that. If you want to contact us afterwards, um, I've asked my colleagues um, who are running the webinar today to put uh, a contact email into the Q&A section so that you know how to contact us and obviously we'll be uh, very happy to talk to you offline. And I hope you have a very good day. Thank you very much. <laughs>